evening, thanks for spending time with us um, this evening. Obviously, we think this is very important. Um, and I, as Mr. Benita said, um, it's a lot of information uh, because we're essentially trying to introduce the whole four years of high school. But it's not like all of the information is going to be immediately used. Um, the reason why we do the introduction for all four years is because of the concept of prerequisites. Um, a lot of times, of course, you have to have one course in order to take another, and unless you look four years ahead and work your way backwards, you may not get to where you want to get in senior year. So it's not that we're asking you to memorize all this information about the next four years, but to think at least initially of a four-year plan, because if you want to reach a certain point, we do um, need you to go back and, and really think where you need to start as your student enters ninth grade. Now, um, it is a lot of information. Um, on the plus side, that means that we have a lot of options for your students in terms of course offerings. So if they're very interested in the arts, we have offerings in the arts. If they're interested in the various academic subjects and they may be more interested in science than English or vice versa. Um, the reason why there's so much information is because of the breadth of our offerings. So that's the plus side, but on the other hand, just like college, it does mean that your students will need to make choices. They can't possibly take all that we offer. Um, and we do think that's a good thing, so that there is choice for those people who have stronger interests in one area um, rather than another. So um, the question always comes up, how do I know who my student's guidance counselor is? Um, so we typically work with people by the letter of the alphabet. The idea being that by the time they get to senior year and we're writing their references for college, the goal is that we know them really well. Um, so we start um, and really keep them ninth through 12th grade. Um, sometimes we've had them in middle school, but there's a slight difference because of the number of students. Um, but in general, Ms. Crop um, has people at the beginning of the alphabet, Ms. Nomet has people in the middle of the alphabet, and I have people at the end of the alphabet. Um, Ms. Lipinski is our administrative assistant. She can always tell you who your child's guidance counselor is if you don't know, um, but it does appear on the schedule um, when we send those out as well in case you forget um, the guidance counselor's name. Um, we are on the website. We all have links in case you want to email us. And we do encourage the, you to set up appointments after tonight. Um, by the way, we will be meeting with your students either Wednesday or Friday of this week to introduce all of these concepts to them as well. And they will come home with these sheets for you to sign. Um, so um, if you would like to meet with your child's guidance counselor um, about course selection because you have some questions about what the best fit is, I would strongly encourage you to do that. So hopefully by the time this evening's over, we're going to uh, have answered your questions about graduation requirements, introduced college admissions requirements, talked about credits needed for graduation, the high school attendance policy, which is different than middle school. We're going to talk about course levels, grade point average, course sequencing in the individual departments like English, social studies, math, and so on. Um, I'm going to show some sample high school schedules and certainly answer questions. All right, one of the handouts you have, and it, while it's small on the screen, I did print it out so that you would be able to see it, is um, a four-year plan with information about what the graduation requirements are for each year. So if we just look at social studies, the top line, um, during freshman year, all students will take World History One or World History One Honors, and I'll explain that in a minute. In 10th grade, the requirement is US History. In 11th grade, they need to do World Two. We also have an advanced placement in AP European History course that satisfies that requirement and then senior year government or AP government. So all of the departments are outlined with where students need to get um, by the time
undergraduate. You're also going to find that information in a different format um, on the scheduling information page. It's going to tell you what ninth graders need to take in a narrative format. It's going to tell you the total number of electives by department that they're going to need to take by the time they reach graduation. So that is the page titled Scheduling Information. And every year your student will have a new one of these um, with that current year's information at the top. Okay. So in high school, um, students are earning credits. And in general, a passing grade is a 60, a D minus. Um, and all students are taking courses on what we call the block schedule. So it really models a college schedule. Um, our, our number of days are a little longer, um, but essentially a course starts in August and ends when the semester ends, the third week in January typically. Um, and a new semester and a new set of classes begins the fourth week in January and goes till school is over in June. So it models the semesterized process of colleges, but again, because we have the 180 days, it goes into January a little bit longer. Um, all students currently are taking 22 and a half credits each semester for a total of 45 credits a year. So they need, by the time they graduate, if they've started with us freshman year and they're with us through senior year, they'll have the potential of taking 180 credits, they need 160 to graduate. So there is a little wiggle room if someone makes a, a mistake. It's not fatal when you make a mistake one course or a couple of courses, because um, there is a little bit of a cushion. Okay, so your middle school students are now with their team. Um, with four academic teachers during English, math, social studies, and science. And they have an advisory block for a half hour, and they have exploratories. They have two blocks for exploratories, and that either falls first thing in the morning or last thing in the day. Um, the high school has four long blocks, so they are blocks that either meet every day of the week, so the course is worth five credits, or they meet every other day, odd or even days, so the course is, earns two and a half credits. And most students take at least three five credit blocks, and then they have a block where they're taking two and a half credit classes. It might be their gym, uh, their PE, and a health, if they are artistic, it might be a Foundations of Art class. It could be something in the wood shop. And it might be a two and a half credit elective in one of the four core academic areas like English, Science, Social Studies, and Math. Um, this block is what we refer, refer to as the short block. It meets every day, but it's for half the amount of time. And during that block, a couple of different things can happen. Um, this past year, we modified the schedule to include this short block for a number of different reasons. The primary reason was to have a period during the day where students had what we would refer to or describe as a directed study and would have access to their teachers um, in a formal process. This also allows us, um, for the first time this year, to have a block for band and strings. And so one of the things that we always were aware of is because a student needs to be someplace every block, they need to have something to do every block, about a ninth or an eighth of our population does band or strings. The other seven eighths doesn't do it, and they have to be in other classes. And we always had conflicts between band and strings and other classes and people were making choices. So we wanted to try to not have students be in that position. So everyone that has high school band or strings has it during C block. They still have to do a pace, but that will happen during one of these every other blocks. 
Um, and there is no what we call singleton, no class that only meets one time that falls during that C block. So students aren't forced to choose for the first time between band and strings and something else. The only thing that happens during that C block, because students only have to do a pace block once a year, they can choose to do it both semesters, but they must do it one semester. The only thing that happens during these block are other classes that these students have a chance to take someplace else, like phys ed or health one that we have multiple sections. So we're very excited about that um, this year. Yes? Pace is the directed study block. The acronym? <laughs> but it is, but it, it's directed study. Yes. yes. Um, okay. So that's how the high school schedule is put together in terms of. Um, now I did mention that high school is a little bit different because there is an attendance policy. Um, in, so students start earning credit in ninth grade. Um, their permanent transcript is with them for the next 60 years. Um, and one of the things that needs to happen is they need to be in school for at least 90% of the time in order to earn credit. So for a five credit class, a class that meets every day, um, they are under that 90, they, within that 90% if they miss nine days or less per semester. For an every other day class, they're within that if they don't miss more than four classes. But the minute they hit the fifth or the tenth, depending on whether the course is every day or every day, they've gone over the 10% mark. Um, and they receive a letter that they've lost credit. Now they do receive a warning letter halfway through or about <coughs> two-thirds of the way through. Um, but it is different from middle school because in middle school they were not earning credit for classes. And so one of the things that we talk about is the fact that um, it's important to keep that in mind. Now, um, certainly if a student has a documented <coughs> medical issue, um, they have a note from a physician, a mental health person, a dentist, because they had to have their wisdom teeth out, whatever it happens to be. That is what is considered an excused absence. Now, this often gets confused because we do ask parents to call their student in when they're absent because we want to know that you know they're not in school. But you cannot excuse that absence. That is something from a medical provider the other thing that counts, obviously, is court, um, in which we can get documentation for. Um, but we still ask that you're calling your students absent um, so that you know that they're not in school. But do please keep the attendance policy in mind, because it is different from what happened in middle school. Any questions about that? Is that something Yes? Just to go back a little bit. So they take, um, you said three, five, four. So typically, I mean, I have some students that take four or five credit courses in a semester, but the typical schedule is that they're taking three, five credit courses each semester. And then how many have? So they're taking two during that other long block, and then they have their short block, their pace. That only adds up to 20, is that right? No, the pace is two and a half. Oh, oh plus pace. Yeah, plus pace. Um, the other thing that is very different um, in high school from middle school is that courses are leveled um, on a number of different points. Um, level zero meaning that the points don't count towards the GPA um, are physical education, cases, skills classes. So it's really content area classes outside of PE that you are getting points towards your grade point average. Um, level one, which is the majority of classes, are college preparatory classes. Level two are considered honors classes, and there will be additional points put in someone's GPA, and I'll show a chart about that in a little bit. And level three, advanced placement, we typically just use the shorthand of AP to refer to those courses, um, even more points into the GPA. Um, and the reason that that is of 
interest to most people is that colleges, four-year colleges in particular, do ask us where a student falls in the class, and Frontier reports by decile. So top 10%, top 30%, what have you. And so if you're taking a course that is harder, the reward is that you have the potential of adding more points into your grade point average. So that's why students, obviously, we hope that they want the challenge, but they also have another reason that they're typically willing to take that challenge on um, because of the addition of the GPA. So, um, so we don't compute individual class rank, um, but weighted grade point average reported by decile is determined by course level and weight. And as you can see, if you earn a B in a regular level one college preparatory class, that's a 3.0. If you do it at the honors level, level two, you're putting an additional 0.3 points into the GPA and AP adding in 0.7. Yes? It's been quite a few years sure. since I was in high school, but um, did the GPA levels change? Because when I was in school, it was 4.0 was the highest. Um, so it may have changed. I mean, it's been this way since I've been here, and I've been here 12 years, but I don't know how far that, that, that goes. But this is a pretty common practice um, um, with schools adding in points for honors and for the and more points for AP. Um, now, what happens, and this is something to keep in mind, I'll, I'll, let me, let me just can you go back to the last slide so I can look at it while you're talking? Sure. UMass Amherst's policy is that they only look at classes in the, what they call the five core academic areas, English, science, math, social studies, and world language. So if you've done well in the arts, they don't count that. Um, they have a policy that they add 0.5 points for an honors course, a whole point for um, an AP course. So a lot of schools do a recalculation anyway, and they have different policies about which classes they count. Um, but we are doing this for the purposes to answer their question about where students fall by decile in the class. So yes, it probably has changed, but I don't know exactly when. Did you have a further question or just I, I to just, reverse the slide? I appreciate you putting the slide okay. up, but you parked yourself right where all the numbers were, so I couldn't okay. see a thing. <laughs> Um, in ninth grade, as I mentioned, um, you're going to have a requirement. Um, it's a fairly simple choice. Um, it's going to be English 9, or you're going to choose to do English at the honors level. Now, you're not going to make that choice with English until you start the class, because the English department handles our summer reading requirement. So they don't have an additional requirement for students going on into the honors level. Um, when a student starts English, whether that happens for that particular student in the fall or the spring, the teacher is going to introduce what's required at the honors level versus what's required at the regular level, and the student will be asked to make a choice at what level they're going to take that class. Um, and so there is no additional required work for ninth or 10th grade honors work um, because of the summer reading coming out of the English department. And that's going to differ a little when I start to talk about some other departments. 10th um, grade, fairly straightforward. Your choice is English 10 or English 10 honors. 11th grade, it's going to start to get a little bit more complicated. People are going to be able to choose to do regular English 11, or they're going to be able to finish, should be able to complete their English 11 requirement by taking AP English Language or AP English Literature and they'll make that choice when they're doing course selection. And just so you know, course selection will fall this time of year from here on. Um, when we go through this, we're, we're at doing these initial meetings with students this week in all 
all of the grades. English 12, a little bit more complicated. They can do regular English 12. They can, once again, choose between AP English Literature or Language if they didn't do one of those or, or didn't uh, do either of those in um, 11th grade. And right now, they can also fulfill their English 12 requirement by taking a class called College Writing. It's always a fall class if students choose to fulfill their English 12 requirement that way. Um, they work on a number of different things. They are primarily focused on writing and research at the college level, um, but one of their initial assignments, if they choose to take that class, is working on their college essay, which a lot of students like to do. Um, they've been pleased with that class and having that opportunity um, if they're not doing something else. There are also electives within the department. I mentioned that part of the, the, the plus is that we have lots of offerings. The downside is you can't take it all. Uh, but if someone is interested in English offerings, we have a journalism class. We have a theater practicum and playwriting class. We have something called advanced writing seminar. We have gender studies, literature of the fantastic, Shakespeare and his contemporaries and the philosophical writing from the world's leading thinkers. Now, they're not all ninth grade offerings. Um, when you look at the back of the choice sheet, you're going to see the offerings that ninth grade students are able to take. Okay, it's with a list, so I'm going to tell you that gender study is one of them. I'm going to tell you that literature of the fantastic is another. Now, say you look at the title of the book, but it's literature of the fantastic. Um, how would I know if my student wanted to take that? I, you know, I'm not sure what that means. So we put out what is called a program of studies, where the person or department teaching the course does a course description describing the content. That is on our website. When we go to the guidance tab, it's high school program of studies, and there is a description for every class. Now, when your student signs up for courses, they are actually doing um, the initial sign-ups electronically. We have the paper copy that they have to then copy it over onto to get your signature because we want to make sure you approve of what they've signed up for. We still think that that's going to be important. But they're going to see a short description online as they're signing up on the computer. They can also, as you can, go to the website and read a full description of any of the courses that we're offering. So. Um, yes? So the elective courses are the 2.5 credit ones. Some of them are 2.5 and some of them are 5. Um, and it will tell you um, what, how many points they are. So um, we have a combination. Um, <coughs> but some place like the science department, I want to say all of their electives are 5 credit. Um, but in English, and we have some offerings in social studies. I think we have one in math, linear algebra, that's 2.5. So there's a combination. What, yes? What about the, um, the AP research and seminar? Is that all under English or science? Or neither neither one, and I'll, I'll, I, I, I will answer it now. I'll get to oh, okay. it later. But it is not, because at one school, um, it might be an English teacher teaching the seminar class, and the, the content might focus on English. In another school, it could be a math teacher. In another school, it could be a social studies teacher. So it doesn't fill departmental requirements. It's considered an elective. Um, and in different schools, it's taught by people in different departments, so it has a different focus. Um, but a great question. <laughs> Um, and those are courses that are um, you can't take until beginning sophomore year. Yes. All right. So let me go on to the next department. Um, next department is probably um, the department with the greatest number of paths or sequencing choices. If you go, um, we have the greatest, as I think any school does difference in terms of people's interest and aptitude, um, I think the math department really varies. And so we have all sorts of different paths for students to complete that math requirement. Um, there's a sheet, because there are so many paths in math where I've put out five possibilities. I'm not even saying that's an exhaustive list. 
but just to give you an idea of the different ways, depending on people's skill, aptitude, and interest in math, that they might go through the high school math curriculum. Okay? So, um, what's going to happen is that, um, if it hasn't already, that this week, um, students' math teachers, eighth grade math teachers, will be meeting with them and giving them their recommendations based on the work that they have seen so far. Um, they know that a student may have a B plus, but they may have had to take retakes for every quiz and exam. That just doesn't come to them easily or naturally. They work really hard um, and they get that grade up, but if you just went on the first grades for every test or quiz they took, they wouldn't have a B plus. And that they may find a more advanced math class a struggle. So they're gonna have conversations with students based on the work that they've seen and their understanding of the high school curriculum because our middle school teachers meet with our high school to, to teachers by department on a regular basis. Yes? Are retakes still an option in high school or does that disappear in that period? Um, that's really at the discretion of the teacher. Um, so there are some times that a teacher may allow a student to do a retake, but they put that out in, typically in their syllabus at the beginning of the course. Um, it's less common. It's not sort of universal. Then depending on the level, so an AP class is going to be less, much less likely than a class where we might have someone who struggles with mathematics. Yes? I was just looking at the different paths and I was wondering, um, how flexible it is if you start off in one and not, you can't quite keep up and you bounce back. Absolutely. Bouncing back is not um, typically the issue. It's if you want to get to both AP classes in math before you graduate, that you need to work your way backwards. But there's no problem hopping off an advanced path. It's the fact that, so let me just give a real comment and see what's. So for our students that love math, this is their favorite subject, they excel at it. They may want to get to both AP classes. The typical sequence is, and I'm working my way backwards, they're going to do AP Statistics senior year, they're doing AP Calculus junior year. That means that sophomore year, they have to take pre-calc honors second semester, which they've taken after they've taken Algebra 2X first semester, and in freshman year, they've either done advanced math in middle school and they just have to take geometry honors, or they're catching up because all of a sudden math is clicked in middle school and they're taking Algebra 1 and Geometry X. And that's the way they're going to get to both AP classes by the time they graduate. Now, as you can quickly tell, taking math every semester, they've far exceeded the minimum requirements of 20 credits in math to graduate. This is someone who loves math. They're thinking about engineering. They're thinking about the hard sciences. Um, they just get math, and they love it. This is not the path for everyone. In fact, it's not the path for most, the majority of students in the class. That's why there are so many different potential paths on the sequence. Um, I have some students who, they get algebra, they can't do the visual stuff in geometry, and vice versa. I mean, and so it, it really is the department with the most differentiation in terms of how people go about satisfying their requirements and taking what they're interested in. So what if you're um, recommending for um, Path 5 geometry, do you end up with only one semester of geometry, or do you do geometry all year? There's no, it's a one semester class. <coughs> So you could end up with math just one yes. semester. Yes. Yes. If you choose to, after taking that class, can you take the algebra for the addition and the
So if they're honors level or AP classes, the expectation of what they're going to retain, remember, review on their own is going to be higher than in the classes that um, are not at that honors or AP level. Um, so um, your student will be getting a recommendation from their eighth grade math teacher. Um, they do have experience, and as I said, they do work very closely with the high school teachers. Um, certainly, if you have a question about that, we would strongly encourage you to talk with the math teacher to begin with, talk to the guidance <coughs> counselor, um, because you may need more information about that recommendation. And that is not uncommon, and we would encourage you to get your questions answered. Yes? These recommendations are coming soon, and how do we find that program? Because that's I mean, I'm hoping your student communicates with you, but they're going to have that sheet. <laughs> and you're always welcome to email your student's teacher. But this is something that it's just part of this. This is all, students are going to be buzzing about this this week because we're doing this scheduling. This is something, and they've got to bring these sheets home and have them signed. And so. We're asking for them back by the 13th. that, you know, what I'm asking for, basically, is, you know, I mean, you know, but, so yes, a parent has a final say. Um, absolutely. Um, and we have some parents, and I'm going to be real honest, that go the other way. Um, the conversation goes something like this. Listen, I know that my son, daughter, got an A-, minus, but I also saw how many hours they had to put into this at home, nights and weekends, I know what they're involved with for activities or sports or outside of school commitments, and I don't, I can't, you know, we're not going through this, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I've had those conversations more often than you might think, uh, where parents have just said, you know, uh, just, they don't need that kind of pressure, or they're very anxious, my child is very anxious, this isn't going to help them, you know, feel confident about school. So it goes both ways, um, believe it or not. All right. All right, so I mentioned that you have the um, reference sheet with the pass. Again, it's small, so I wanted to make sure you had the hand up to take with you. I know that I have trouble when I'm in a presentation <coughs> something like that. Um, all right, social studies. <laughs> Again, somewhat similar to English, a little more straightforward. Um, students are going to be required to take world history, U.S. history, world history two, or history of government for public. Very similar to English, the choice that they're making about world history is between honors and regular. The difference is they're going to have to make that decision now. There is going to be a summer assignment for world history at the honors level that they're going to need to complete and get to the teacher by a certain date over the summer in order to remain scheduled in that class. So that is the difference. As I said, English already has summer reading and a summer assignment, so they don't require it ahead of time or in addition, but history is, that's the difference. So when they do that in ninth grade, if they choose to do honors history in 10th grade, it's going to be the same thing. All of our AP courses have required summer work that will have a summer deadline. Um, whether that's AP English Lit, AP English Language, something in the sciences, math, or social studies, or computer science. So, um, so pretty straightforward, 9th and 10th grade, 11th grade, they can fulfill the World History II requirement if they choose to do AP European History, uh, because that covers the content of World History II, and then um, AP Government covers the, the U.S. Government requirement. We again have lots of electives, um, and I've got some stars on this slide that I just changed this past week. Um, <coughs> Because for the first 
first time, students who have achieved a certain um, percentile score on their NWEA testing, and hopefully if you've had students in the system all through elementary school, you've heard about NWEA testing, and you may wonder how we use it. This is one of the ways. So if a student has scored in the 88th percentile or above on their NWEA, and they have at least a B plus average in their English and Social Studies classes through the end of first semester in eighth grade, and the teacher recommends them, they do have to talk to their teachers about it, um, they, for the first time, are going to be able to take an AP class if they want to and they have room in their schedule. And I'll come back to that in a minute. In ninth grade, um, when we did a study of the AP classes, that is the class that, as we look um, uh, at the offerings, that ninth graders are, have been, across the country, most successful in. And so we're pleased, um, for those of you who have older students, this is something that you're going to notice change to offer this is the first AP class that they might take in ninth grade. Um, other electives, and I'll come back to room in your schedule in a minute, but other electives within the social studies department are psychology, sociology, those are both five credit classes, current events or current events at the honors level, street law and your bill of rights are 2.5 credit <coughs> electives. So again, the combination, summer five, summer 2.5, um, and that's the, the AP Human Geography. And, and um, what I want to say is that um, there is an AP night um, being held tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock, same location, where the AP teachers will be present to talk about their courses. So if you have an interest, and you, it doesn't just have to be for next year, there's no reason that you might want to be doing some pre-thinking about AP in, um, you know, grades further down the road, that's fine, um, but you're certainly invited to attend um, and speak to the teachers about the content of the classes, the expectations. So AP essentially means it's a college level curriculum. It is a national curriculum that there isn't really discretion in terms of what to teach or what the expectations are um, because everybody across the country is teaching the same content at the same time. There is a required exam in May. Uh, again, national exam, national test date, um, where all students in the country who are taking that AP class are taking that exam at the same time. Um, that is scored by the college board. Um, and then colleges each determine if they're going to accept AP credits, first of all, at all, and what score you have to have on individual courses for them to accept that for credit. Um, but as I said, this is the first time that Frontier is offering any AP class to ninth graders. Um, so it's something you know, that you may want to think about. Now you may want to say, well, I don't know what my child's NWEA score was when they took it in the fall. Um, students can meet with their guidance counselors. We have the forms that have been developed um, that first of all, so that we can verify they have the 88th percentile and um, the grade, it has places for them to get signatures from their current um, English language arts and social studies teachers. Now here's what I said I would come back to um, when I said, talked about space in their schedule. Um, I haven't even got to science yet. But say your student is taking two math classes next year. They're doing Algebra 1 and Geometry X. And when I get to science, they may want to take two science classes. And they want to start their foreign language. And I've already said they have to have an English, and I've already said they have to have world history. Um, and then you say they want to be in the band. Um, and I'm telling you, you know, and yeah. So AP human geography just might not fit, given what their other choices and priorities are. Another student may say, well, I'm not musical. Um, I'm, I'm not going to take band. Um, I, I already did um, the advanced math, so I only have one math course in my schedule, so I have an extra five credits there. Um, someone may say, I really just want science. I'm doing a minimum. I'm taking one a year between now and when I graduate, but I love social studies. So I want to use my space to fit in this AP class and test it out because this is my
my passion. I've always excelled and science just is not my thing. So every student is going to be different um, in terms of what their choice is. But the bottom line is we only have 45 credits to work with a year. That's the only thing that there's limited time and space in the day. And they will be making choices all through high school. They will be making choices when they get to college. And so it's what is a priority? Where are their interests right now? Yes? So you're saying that the kids will basically have to take like one science, one math, one history, one English every year? Um, so yes, or except we're going to be done in each semester. Not each semester. This is, this is, so courses will either go from August to the third week in January or from the fourth week in January about till the end of June. Like I said, similar to a college schedule, but we require more days. We have the 180 day requirement, so our semesters are longer. So can I, I guess, I don't know, like this must be like a generational thing. It's much different from when I went to school, where you had like- You had like seven periods a day, and they were year long. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm just wondering like, if your child chooses to not take two semesters of science, and it's like doing the minimum, no, because they're that filling better. it with other things. So, like I said, no, I, I understand oh, that. Okay. I'm more so wondering, like, does that look, in terms of when they do apply to college, in the eyes of the college, is it more appealing to them? <coughs> they really did like two semesters of, of science every year, like two semesters of. So, if they're university. going on in the hard sciences or engineering, absolutely. If they're going to be a language major, does does the college? care as much that they've had science eight semesters? No. So part of it will depend ultimately on their goals and what they're interested in. I do have one other question about language, actually. Sure. Okay. Um, I haven't got there, but... <laughs> okay. I am... Do, what is the highest level of language that the kids can take? Because I was under the impression from a couple other discussions that it was just four classes and that, that if they wanted to take one a semester would then be done at the end of 10th grade. They could no be. They could be. Absolutely. What if they want to pursue it more? So again, I'm going to get to this, but juniors and seniors have some options through what's called virtual high school. And I'll get there, I promise. Uh, but again, most students, because of everything else they want to take, they're not going to necessarily have room or want to double up in language both freshman year and sophomore year can be done. Um, you know, I, I have never seen anybody complete because of all the other things they might be interested in taking. Is there, like conversational? Because I know when I was in high school, you got to a level where you were like past the basic classes and then you were in conversational where you just only spoke the language all throughout class. Is that an option that they have here or does it kind of pop so, out? And just so it tops out at level four, but they are definitely doing conversational language in level four. Yes. Yes. Just a quick math question. Algebra one and algebra one A, I know algebra one A is kind of stretched out. Algebra what's the credit, one, what's the credits for each of the? So algebra one A gets five credits. They are taking that class every other day, okay. year long. Every other day. Yep. And then um, they would take the second half of algebra in their freshman I'm sorry, their sophomore year first semester. And they would do that in one semester, and then they're going to do geometry in the second semester. So I started to say, in general, it's a minimum of one science, one English, one social studies. But we do have an exception for sophomore year math, where students must take at least, must take math at least two courses. Um, and we are, doing that because our curriculum director and our department chairs in math and all of the teachers have looked at it and looked at how we can best achieve MCAS success and it's by having double math in sophomore year, the year that they take the math MCAS. So I do want to just state that that is a little bit of an exception to the general minimum of one every four years and, and that is on the sheet. So. Anything before I go on to the next department? Okay. Sure. <coughs> when it comes to, as they was asked with the world languages, where you could potentially be done with your course requirements by different grade, 
is that possible with any of the core classes as well, science, social studies, math, or English? So or not English, because that's a that's set up so that you have to take one every year. Not social studies, that's set up where you have to take one every year. You're required to do at least one math every year, sophomore year two. The science, sometimes people do finish. Again, not typically in two years because of everything, <coughs> but sometimes they've met the minimum of the four classes and they hate science and they don't want to take any more. Sometimes they've met that by, by the end of junior year. Yeah. So that would be the other core department that would happen. Uh, so science, again, 20 credits. Um, every student at Frontier needs to take science and technology, biology, and chemistry. So at a minimum, they're going to need to do science and technology freshman year. And a minimum biology sophomore year. Many of our students want to double up. They want to get down here to some of these AP classes. So they're going to double up in science and technology and biology freshman year. They're going to do chemistry and perhaps one of the electives. You know, I have people that think they might be interested in going on in medicine. They want to be OT, PT, whatever. So they might do anatomy and physiology. And then they're looking to perhaps do AP Bio one year, AP Chem another year. So um, if someone loves sciences, or they think they do at the start of freshman year, they may want to double up to be able to get down to some of these other electives um, in junior and senior year when they're offered. And we have four AP classes in the sciences, two offered um, each year. So this year we're doing AP Physics and AP Environmental. Next year it will be AP Chem and, uh, I'm sorry, we're doing AP Physics and AP Bio. Next year AP Environmental and Chem. And we rotate those every two years. So um, these are other electives in terms, so they might fill their fourth science if they just want to do the minimum. They might do Environmental. They might do Forensics. If they're not into science, they may not do biotech or physics. Um, but some people may say, listen, I don't want to do AP level courses in science, but I do want to do some of the higher level regular science classes. So people are making those choices. Okay, but you've got to do a minimum of four over the four years. Now, um, beginning next year, I do want to say for those of you with older children, the state is changing things. They are no longer offering really two of the science MCASs that they've done previously, but it includes science and technology. So next year, uh, for the first time, it will be the bio MCAS that they're doing as their high school sort of state exit requirement. Um, whether they end up taking biology freshman year or sophomore year, they will take that um, at the end of that year in whatever year they choose to take biology. So we do have some students who want to do their science MCAS in ninth grade so that they're not necessarily taking all three sophomore year, although in many cases they will take them. They're, they're offered three different months in the spring, um, but sometimes people like to get one of those done. So it will be bio for the state beginning in 2021. So a little bit of a change if you have older students. Yes? Is collectives here? Again, they differ. Um, it will, um, they are all, none of them are available in ninth grade because you need to start with all of these. These are typically the requirements for, you know, the other classes. So they, right, I mean, it will tell you you've got a sheet with all the prerequisites on the back, but students are going to start with SciTech and Bio. Um, if they're doing two, those are the two that they're doing in ninth grade. Um, and then they're going to take, if they're continuing on that path of, you know, wanting to take and maximize, they're going to do chemistry and something else. Um, but, like, we need to do bio before environmental, we need to do bio before anatomy. Physics actually has a certain level of math that you have to have in addition to the intro science classes. So every course that has prerequisites, that information is listed. science uh, reference sheet, um, not as many paths as math uh, because it's not quite as complicated, but there still are a number of options. Yes? This might be premature, but I am curious, um, I've heard from some other parents, not from this district, but in neighboring districts, 
sure kids have the opportunity at a certain point to take classes at a local college. Yep, we're going to get to dual enrollment, I promise. So okay. uh, um, that's a little bit later on. Um, so let me finish up the departmental requirements before I talk about some of those extras. Um, world language. Um, so Frontier as a graduation requirement requires at least 10 credits, which is two courses of the same language at the high school level um, in order to meet graduation requirements. <laughs> But I'm going to tell you, if your student is looking at applying to private schools, they want at least three years of the same language. Um, and if they want to do something international, if they want to do something in the languages themselves, they're really going to go through you know, the four years of the language. So two years is the graduation requirement. But this is one of the things that we talk to students. There is a difference, typically, between the requirements of some colleges and the graduation so you want to be aware of that with the language in particular. Okay. We offer at the high school level French, Latin, or Spanish, and students can choose among those three languages. Um, we require five credits in health. Um, typically, students take health one freshman year and health two sophomore year, unless there's some reason for them needing an exception. They take physical education every year. It's a two and a half credit every other day class. Um, typically, it's one each year, although I have some students that love phys ed, they can't take more than six classes in high school. We do put a cap on it, uh, but believe me, I have some that we do it all the time if they put. Um, we do have a, a one minimal art requirement, and an art is really um, defined very broadly. It's a traditional art class, it can be a music class, it can be a theater class, it can be some of the art-related um, technology classes like photography and digital design where they are, as you might have noticed as you've come up, really creating works of art on the computer um, or woodworking. So there are a variety of ways to satisfy that two and a half credit requirement in high school. And as I said and talked about earlier, we have introduced the PACE requirement. They must take that at least one semester each year in high school. Um, many of our students found it very beneficial and ask for a second semester. Um, you know, this has just been um, really given them the ability to talk to faculty members during the day. Um, we have numbers of students that participate in athletics, and even though the teachers may be available, they're not, or they work, something of that nature, or, um, you know, transportation's an issue in terms of them staying after school, they've got to go home on the bus, whatever it happens. So this has been something where are allowed to do a PACE both semester, but they must do it at least one semester a year. So that's where the come in. All right, some of the things, and I have alluded to some of them, um, the, the question about AP seminar and AP research. So it doesn't fall within a department. Um, it doesn't fulfill your history requirement, even though it may be taught by a history teacher or an English teacher. It is elective credit. So when we look at you know, 20 credits in English, 20 in science, so on, that doesn't add up to the 180. There are 30 some odd elective credits. Some students will fill that by doing extra science or, or math. Some may fill it by extra social studies. Some may choose to do the AP um, capstone or AP diploma. Um, let me explain what that means. AP seminar and AP research are each five credit classes. AP seminar must be taken first. It's the prerequisite for AP research. Students can start taking seminar as early as sophomore year if they want and it fits into their schedule. Not only do they need to take the class, but in order to get the AP certificate from the college board, they must score a three or better on those AP examinations that happen in May that I talked about, the required tests. The diploma is the AP seminar, the AP research, and four additional AP classes. So all six scoring three or higher to get the AP diploma. Um, and there are, there is the AP program tomorrow night uh, where you can talk to individual teachers in the department courses and the seminar and research classes. But, but like the AP diploma, you get that as you're graduating, but college, you're already So college. what happens is, um, 
most colleges, not most, but uh, the vast majority of colleges today are using what's something called the Common App. And there is a series of questions when you're, the guidance counselor goes in to fill out the Common App action. One of the questions is, is this student even a candidate for the AP diploma? So that's the first indication that the college gets if a student is trying this. But you're right, if you're not taking those AP classes till senior year, those scores won't come in until July. But you're typically going to have those sent to the college that you're attending. Right, they see your intent. Right, but yeah, they see the intent. But most students are not going to finish all six um, before senior year. Right, but we will let them know that they're on the path or you know attempting to do that. Yeah. All right. Um, there are um, other departments, um, visual arts, performing arts, music, industrial technology, which everybody uses the shorthand of woodshop, um, information technology electives, um, and some in consumer health. Um, and again, um, those electives that students are able to look at are listed on the sheet each year. So for instance, something like street law, which we talked about in the social studies department is for 11th and 12th graders. So that's not going to appear on the ninth grade sheet because that's not an option for freshmen and sophomores. But each year, more and more becomes available. And your students have more room for electives in their schedule as well. So, um, OK. OK, new this year, yes. Uh, well, I was curious, what, um, was that consumer health? Health, PE, um, it's, there's a yoga class, I mean, there are other things under that department. What's um, the Some years there's been a foods class. Why consumer? That's the okay. title that they've given, I mean, it, so okay. some of the classes cover financial literacy, some cover okay. nutrition, some cover, you know, so it's just sort of, they're all encompassing title for that department yeah, and the offerings within what's it. What's street law? Street law is an elective in the social studies department that looks at various things um, under the law that the teacher feels that the average consumer should know about. Housing law, um, of, you know, issues like that. Um, and it's a, an elective, it's an introduction to the concepts um, that she feels. So unlike, you know, being sort of an expert in even try uh, <laughs> uh, but you know common things like you know she might introduce trust in it you know the fact that people might want to have a will they might want to have a health care proxy they might want to have a power of care they might want to have a homestead after their house whatever it happens I don't know the detail that she goes in but looking at the average thing that she thinks consumers should know about the law Um, so SEAL uh, by Literacy, new this year. Um, this is um, an opportunity for students to, sort of similar to AP Capstone and AP Diploma, but to receive a designation on their diploma and in the materials communicated to colleges that they have demonstrated proficiency in English and another partner language. Um, at the intermediate high le or high level or beyond. And so <coughs> students need to have a score that is the equivalent of advanced or proficient or meets or exceeds expectations depending on when they took the MCAS, the terminology changed, um, on the MCAS English Language Arts exam for grade 10. And then they also have to do another test um, and in the other language, the other partner language, and it's really testing them in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And there is going to be information coming out from the school. There's going to be correspondence specific about the seal of my literacy that is going to be coming home. Um, but I just wanted to mention it because it's new this year. Um, and it's something that the, the, the world language teachers are very excited about because they sometimes, I think, feel they might be competing with AP classes and that it's students who really have a sincere interest in language, um, who want to express that and want colleges to know about this, may be interested in pursuing this designation, testing to, to, to get this. And so um, it's something that the state started uh, fairly recently and that we're excited to be a part of beginning this year.
again, I said some of the, the other options, dual enrollment being one of them. So there are four um, categories that I want to talk briefly that are additional options, uh, electives open once you reach junior and senior year. Uh, I'll start with dual enrollment because that was the first question. <coughs> dual enrollment is when you're enrolled at a college and the credits transfer back onto your transcript here in high school. <coughs> now, different schools offer dual enrollment <coughs> opportunities. The most common place that students do that is at the community college level. They have programs that have been set up to do this for years. They like this. They make it very, very easy. Uh, they have advisors specifically for the dual <coughs> enrollment process. Frontier requires that any student who wants to do this have a minimum of a 3.0 GPA in order to be able to apply. Because it follows the college process. There are no midterm grades. There are no uh, progress report grades. It's the final grade in a college course at the end. So students need to have a track record of success in terms of independent <coughs> and learning. The community colleges aren't the only schools that offer dual enrollment. They make it the easiest, but we have had students go down to do at UMass. They find the bureaucracy a little difficult to manage, unless they typically have a parent that works there and can help them through. But on the occasion, we have someone that will do that. Um, I had someone do that at Smith, but what we found out is that Smith wouldn't count any of the classes that came back on their transcript here towards their own degree. So every school can make their own policies. And so you've got to be aware of that. Um, you know, the community colleges want you to, want those credits to count in both places. Other places may say, no, um, you know, you can't double dip. Um, so uh, other colleges offer dual enrollment, um, but it is up to the student and the family to pursue those options independently. Um, we don't pretend to know the regulations of every school. We will help them in terms of verifying that a course meets our graduation requirement. And let me just give a specific example. So if a student goes up to GCC for senior year, they have a government requirement. We have determined that the American politics class at GCC meets our requirement for government. So when a student is doing dual enrollment, we have to have an equivalent class if they're meeting our graduation requirements. Does that answer your question about dual enrollment? OK, three other things. Um, again, that are available beginning junior year. Virtual high school, which I have mentioned. Yes, it's in a room. Oh, sorry. So, and that's happening during the regular school day hours, or sometimes it's not? Typically, they're, if they're doing it on a part-time basis, they're taking some classes here and going up there. They're, they're not starting their classes at the community college or the college until at least 3 o'clock, because they've got to allow for travel time. Um, so but some students saying. do full-time dual enrollment, where they're gone and they can pick classes at whatever time they want them to start. Me meaning like that they're at the college all day rather than in the high school setting? Mm -hmm. But for the other kids, they have to finish their full day of school here and then... They, right, they have to be able to get to the classes consistently. Yeah. 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 But I'm saying it's never an opportunity for like, say, you know, if they don't have class so our on. high school schedule rotates. Um, so first of all, we have odd and even day classes. So on a given week, you might have a class that meets Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then the following week because the even days fall on Tuesday and Thursday. So, and then we flip the last block and the first block. So it's very difficult to do it, to take a class during the day because the college courses meet consistently, say, a Tuesday and Thursday at 10.30. So typically, they're taking them after school hours if they're doing it part time. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yes? I don't know if this is The difference between the total and the early graduation? Uh, it's not premature. Um, early graduation means that, um, as I mentioned, there is a cushion. And so for students that pass every single class and manage to schedule all of their required classes in their first semester senior year, um, a lot of them um, who are interested in starting, and usually it's at the community colleges, um, that's been our experience. They, they know they're headed towards the associate's degree. 
Um, they have, even though we only have one graduation ceremony a year, um, we write a letter that says, for all intents and purposes, John has met his graduation requirements as of January 17th when our semester end, ended, even though we only have one ceremony a year. So that allows them to be considered an early grad. Um, that is important for applying for financial aid. The students can't apply for financial aid for dual enrollment um, classes. So that's the advantage. But if you're playing sports, MIAA does not allow you to graduate early. So if you're doing a winter or spring sport, you're not able to do the early graduation because you must be enrolled here at Frontier. Okay, does that answer the early grad? Yes. Just one other question about when it comes to taking classes here at a community college or It seems like the most you can get a semester for credits through Frontier is 22.5, but if you're taking classes here and you're taking so you're replacing one on one for one. So uh, if you're taking a three or four credit college class, it is replacing five credits here. If you're taking a one credit college class, so that's so typically people are filling their phys ed requirement by taking yoga or taekwondo or what have you at the community college or at school, and that comes back as a one credit class. That comes back to their 2.5. So even if you have scheduled here 22.5 credits. You're not getting no, you're typically dropping one of the classes here, and what they're trying to do is do that so it's like the last class of the day or something like that. Yeah. Yes? So the, what about the grading? Do you grade the college? The we class? take whatever grade they give us. They give you. So, it's not, so if you would take an AP English here versus an intro to English at a community college? Are they Those come as back as level one, level one class, the classes college. from the community college, right? They don't have an AP. Yeah, so I mean, so if your student was going right. to see which one would help his GPA most, the it's going to be AP class. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and because the community colleges have open enrollment, a lot of the private schools feel have a preference. They'll tell you they have a preference for the AP. Um, it, but if you are going to do the Mass State Transfer, you want to start a community college, get your bachelor's, and apply the Mass State Transfer to one of the four-year universities, that's a great option. So there are different, depending on what your goal is for college, depends on what is the best choice for you. There's not a right or wrong. Okay, um, virtual high school. Um, so there, uh, we participate in uh, international program. It's not just national uh, virtual high school. Um, so if a student is interested in a class that we do not offer here, AP Spanish conversation. They may be able to do that through virtual high school. They substitute that for an elective that we offer here in the building. They basically are working here in the library because it's being taught online by someone somewhere. Um, and uh, we have a person who is getting their grade from the online instructor. Um, but we, it can only be a class that Frontier doesn't offer. So I've had students do everything from Irish <coughs> literature, which is not one of our offerings, you know, to something um, like uh, the AP Spanish conversation class. So um, that is a way of going beyond the four credits in the lang uh, the four levels in the language, but only for classes that Frontier can't um, supplant one of the classes. The classes we offer it can only supplement in terms of things that we don't. Um, independent study is when a student works under the direction of a faculty member doing independent research on an agreed upon project. Um, they have to have a product at the end and they do what's called a performance based assessment in front of the school administration. That becomes their final exam grade. Um, but it is for students that are looking to go beyond what they might have in a particular elective. So, um, I've had students who, you know, they've taken the playwriting course or they've done the journalism and they love to write. And so they might do an independent study and write short stories or do poetry. Or um, I have had students who have taken anatomy and physiology. They want to go on and they want to be something in the medical field. And they want to do more of the systems of the body than they covered in anatomy and physiology. So they do them in a variety of areas. But
but it's independent research with a performance-based assessment and a written product. Um, and then school to community service is when students are um, looking to either volunteer or work. Uh, some students do it in school, some students do it out of school. I have a couple of students every year that think they want to be teachers. They go over to Deerfield Elementary, which they're able to get to during the day, um, and you know work under the supervision of a teacher there. Um, again, it's elective credit. You don't do that until junior or senior year, but those are some of the additional options beyond the curricular offerings that we have. Um, we are doing course requests at this point, and I do need to emphasize that they are requests. Um, unfortunately, if I get six signups for a class, Mr. Linnaeus is going to be physically responsible, and he's going to tell me we can't run that class. We can't have one class with only six students in it. It's not a good use of taxpayer funds. And we're not going to run that class. So if your student has signed up for that class, we're going to need to go to an alternative. Um, and that's a, so it's important to know that every year, this is a request process at this time. That doesn't mean that that's going to be their final schedule. The other thing can, that can happen in a school of our size, a small school with lots of offerings, is that we can have what are called sentences. So we are typically going to have only one advanced writing class. If it happens that for 95% of the kids, it works best at the same time street law is offered, then it may fall at the same time. And they both may be singletons, and a student who wanted to take both may have to choose between the two different electives. Obviously, students are going to get the classes, the required classes they need to graduate, but when we get into electives, we have to have multiple offerings every block. And so this is a request process annually. Um, we work with students as the spring semester goes on to try to finalize their, their schedule. Um, and it gets mailed home the second week of August in the summer, usually you know, with some other information from the school. And it will tell you what semester the course is offered, semester one or semester two, something like BAN, which the official title is Wind Ensemble, is every day all year during that C block, that short block, the pace block. It will say the location, it will tell the amount of credits the course is worth, and who's teaching it. It will also say the group that it's actually assigned in. Um, so people's schedules look different. Someone may have English in the fall, someone else could have it in the spring. Um, it's going, they're going to be dramatically different from the middle school schedules um, because of just the sheer number of choices and options and different permutations to people's schedules and what they take. This is just a different view of that schedule um, into that block model that I showed earlier. So this person will have their geometry X. They already had algebra one in advanced math in middle school. They are in band, so that falls in that short block. Their pace block is going to be every other day, be one opposite health. They're taking world history at the honors level. They're taking the sign tech. Their English nine fell here. They chose to take Latin. Um, foundations of art, opposite the physical ed, and they wanted to double up in the sciences in Dubai. Now that looks very different from the next schedule. So again, the format, um, but easier to read this way. So this person, um, they are a student, they're on an IEP. They're going to have their skills during C block. They're not taking pace if they have a skills lab. That is sort of a, a we don't want them to have um, all of that time in what is essentially a directed study. So they're going to take Algebra 1A all year. Um, they don't find math as easy. Um, they've got that every other day all year. Um, they're not necessarily choosing to do stuff at the honors level. They wanted to fit in a programming class every other day, two and a half credits. They also were interested in the business and marketing elective. So you can see that the schedules are vastly different depending on what someone's goals and interests are. Um, and, um, but they, they will come in the previous <coughs> format. I do want to mention um, that in addition to scheduling, we do a lot of other things in the guidance office. Um, we obviously meet with students throughout the year. We cover the three domains. We do do, obviously, the academic advising, which has been my emphasis tonight. 
with college planning with students, and we do work with students on personal, social, emotional issues. So um, we are seeing students for all of those reasons throughout the year. Um, we do do the scheduling program, uh, meaning that I've already described every year. Sophomore year, we offer the PSATs and the pre-ACTs, which are the pre-tests for the two primary college entrance exams. Um, we also do an interest inventory with sophomores. Um, we think it's important that they start to think, not necessarily make any final decisions, but start to think about what they're interested in doing. It really is a program that brings them from what they're interested in to what majors you need and then what schools offer that major so that they begin to look at that. They're not making final decisions at that point, but we feel it's important to get them started on that process. Junior year, um, students can again take the PSAT if they choose. It's optional junior year, required sophomore year. Um, the pre-ACT is only given sophomore year because that has predictive ability for a year in advance of when students take it. And we're recommending that if students are taking the ACT or the SAT that they're doing that spring of their junior year. Um, we start college and career workshops with juniors. Uh, in fact, I, we did a junior program yesterday, um, and we obviously continue that into senior year, um, really working with people pretty much on an individual basis um, for the college application process. Or if they're going into the workforce, military, um, whatever it happens to be. Yes, it's junior year, the standard year where we start applying for things like scholarships and grants and stuff? Um, most of the scholarships grants you're actually applying for senior year, but you start looking at them, um, and because most of them require, a lot of them require extensive essays and that sort of thing, and a lot of them are unique. You know, whatever they give it the award for, they want you to speak to that. So if you can start that junior year, sort of, uh, because most of them are annual scholarships, uh, especially the regional and national ones, that's a good idea. Does Frontier have a list of available ones and guidance counselors will help so we, everything we have, we put up on the guidance website. We put up scholarship updates throughout the year. National ones come up first, then regional ones, and then our local scholarships in the spring. Um, so, you know, the civic organizations and the like, uh, they give them. Um, there are hyperlinks, typically, to the national and regional ones because they want all of their stuff online. The local ones tend to have a paper process still. Um, there also are websites for scholarship research, um, and we provide those uh, URLs to students who want to go beyond what is mailed to every school. So hopefully, as we've gone through, we've answered some of the questions, but are there any general questions that people would like to ask that I didn't cover? Go ahead. <laughs>
music technology, to guitar, to piano. Um, and I'm not going to say that every single elective runs every year, but um, guitar and piano are pretty, pretty much every year. And what so. would those be kind of like, like a teacher with, say, five students? Not five, but or, <laughs> a little or more. Let's say 50, whatever. Yeah, the well, yeah, right. So, um, yes. Yeah, so um, they they would have a guitar, and typically all the students who are interested. But we do have a couple that we're we're able to provide the pianos. We have their keyboards. They're not full size pianos. No, they don't have to. Carry them. Yeah, they don't have to carry that back and forth to school. Um, but we have um, you know sort of I think they're Casio keyboards, and it's an introduction to piano. Because I know, like, yeah, if they, they don't want to be in a, in a chorus band. Or Absolutely. Something. Yep. Okay. And there also are some after school things um, that students are involved in musically. Everything from a garage band referred to as the Rock and Red Hawks, um, which is really more student oriented and student driven, um, to things that the music teacher does after school, like a jazz ensemble. So that they're numbered, and you know, each class knows, uh, each student in the various classes knows what their number is, and so that's the expectation. If a student, if a teacher is not allowing f the phone to be used for academic purposes, but they do have them on them, and unlike the middle school, they do, you, they are able to use them at lunchtime and you know that sort of thing, but not during the middle of class. The other difference, and the thing where I thought you might be going with the electronics, is the difference in the Chromebooks. High school students bring them home, unlike middle school students who have to leave them at school. So um, there, you know, there is a user agreement and all of that for the high school, but because of the nature of the, the, the work that they're doing, they do, at the high school level, bring the Chromebooks home. Is it a charger for a Chromebook? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not like in the middle school where they're plugging it in, in the teacher's classroom with their advisory teacher. Information you presented tonight is it presented to the students in, in, in at this level of detail, such that so that they have all that information. You know, I mean, obviously we're guiding them in their choices, but they may self-direct which. You know, I mean, so is all of it presented to them? So they get the, the information. I'm not going to tell you they don't ask your level of questions. So it's not as long of a presentation. I will be very honest with you. I mean, they get the information, but they're they're not as savvy a consumer as their their parents are. So they're not. But th when we meet with them, they will be getting this kind of information. Yes. 
Right, so they were told for, they'll be told like in the beginning, for example, about the um, capstone choices or the, you know, the AP diploma choice, like, like some of the big picture things where if they just choose to want to take that direction or, you know, or, or is it the expectation that, you know, I mean, it's going to be up to so, them. So we're going to talk to them about the fact that you want to make a four-year plan, you want to look at, you know, what you may want to get to senior year in order to back it up. You know, the concept of prerequisites was already introduced to them when they went from seventh to eighth grade with their exploratories. Um, and we do that on purpose to really get them to start to understand that concept, even though they're not making a lot of choices seventh through eighth. Um, there are things like multimedia two and 3D art, which had prerequisites, but they're getting the information about the four-year plan and prerequisites and backing things up. <coughs> Absolutely. I'm going to tell you that they don't get it at your level. I'm going to be really honest. And we do these sessions every year and emphasize what's most important for that year. You know, it, so this isn't like a one-shot thing, eighth going into ninth for them. They're getting this on an annual basis. And so I'm going to tell you that when I meet with juniors tomorrow, they will, so the, those four options that weren't available till junior year, I'm going to be really emphasizing that because that's going to be the first time they can do independent studies, dual enrollment. And so do we emphasize everything at the same level? No. But they get the idea of four-year plan and prerequisites and having some idea but we also don't want to terrorize them because they can get overwhelmed very, very quickly with the idea that they need to know what they're going to do. Um, and, and we're trying to strike a balance between preparing them and overwhelming them. Other questions? This has been a great session with lots of questions, but I have kept you for an hour and a half, and I do recognize that some people probably need and want to leave, um, but I will be up here for a few minutes after if people have individual questions, and certainly you know, encourage you to contact your student's guidance counselor. Thanks very much for everything tonight.